Hello everybody, this is Chris Cruzens. I'm here with Rita Severis. Can you tell us about this uh, museum here? And give us a little tour and give, tell us your name again. I'm Rita Severis and I'd like to welcome you to the Costas and Rita Severis Foundation. Thank you very much. Uh, and especially to the Center of Visual Arts and Research, which is our home. Let me tell you a few words about the building to begin with. This building in the 19th century used to be an old Ottoman Han. In the 1950s, the Han was demolished and uh, we, uh, a Greek Cypriot family built here an industrial building, a flour mill. But thank goodness they kept the shape so we have the internal courtyard, which is now used for, all our event, for many of our events. Uh, we bought the building in 2008 and uh, uh, we restored it with the help of the USAID and the EEA Norway grants. Um, and we made it our home, which uh, houses the collections of the Costas and Rita Severis Foundation. Um, the collections consist of 1, 000, about 1,500 paintings by traveling artists to Cyprus with the theme Cyprus, about 500 costumes that show the development of the Cypriot dress and the influences it received from East and West, and many, many memorabilia. Parallel to this, we have a research center, four floors of books, about 10,000 books on Cyprus, history, um, travel, art, a huge archive that hasn't been used, and about 10,000 photographs. 5,000 belong to us, uh, which were photographs from the 1880s to the, to the 1960s of Cyprus, of course, but now recently with a donation by Kate Claridis of her father's collections. Another 5,000 approximately photographs have been added, which show the history of the political life of Cyprus from 1960 to today. Then so then we're now complete. Independent, yeah, that's yes, good. Yes, and yes, you want to exactly. show us a little bit about the museum yes. inside? Uh, I'll just museum, follow you. The museum, as you can see from the moment you enter, does not have one step. It's been done um, especially to receive people uh, with special needs. Uh, for the that, we also have a, 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 a lift that oh, goes up four floors. Let's go in. The, the Costas and Rita Severis Foundation basically has two aims. It, uh, uh, the promotion of Cypriot culture, locally and abroad, of course, and the promotion of peaceful coexistence between the various communities of Cyprus and especially between the Greek and Turkish community. To this respect, uh, to, we, towards this goal, we have Turkish Cypriots on our board and we uh, work closely with many Turkish Cypriot NGOs. But as you can see here, all our texts are written in Greek, Turkish, and English. Which are, by the way, the official languages of the Cyprus. Yes, and yeah. we are the That's first good. and only by communal museum in this respect. Wow. Uh, this is the ground floor. In the ground floor, you s we start with the 18th century. Um, how uh, Cyprus in the context of Europe, how the cartographers associated Cyprus with Venice, how the old masters were inspired by mythology and Venus in Cyprus. Here we have Aphrodite um, arriving at uh, Paphos, how the women were dressed in, in the 18th century, the Cypriot ladies were dressed in Ottoman clothing because we were an Ottoman uh, uh, province. And then we have, at the end of the 18th century, the first uh, real depictions of Cyprus in watercolor and in oils. I mean, Luigi Meyer, the Austro-Italian artist, uh, visits Amethyst. As you can see here, the French artist Louis Francois Cassas uh, visits uh, Bellabais and he does the watercolor and the engraving for his book. Real, real 
nice. Louis Ferrand gives us a multicultural view of Cyprus, the Frankish castle, the Christian church, the Maronite priest, the Ottoman, the European traveler, and the flora of Cyprus, the cypress tree, the palm tree, the carob tree, and the olive tree, and green meadows. I'm sure this must have been either January or February, because Cyprus doesn't really no, no, have yeah. green meadows. Um, a view of Larnaca, Salt Lake, with uh, the monastery of St. George the Distant. This is actually an embroidery on silk. The cotton flax people, I don't know if you know about them, Lino Bambaji, as we call them. Yeah, the, 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 the Greek know, yeah. Cypriots that <laughs> couldn't pay taxation and turn to Islam. Well, there you have. Kasuridis that turned into Mustafa Aga. And just underneath, a beautiful watercolor, very detailed watercolor of St. Nicholas Cathedral, where the kings of the Lusinians were crowned kings of Jerusalem and Armenia. The British consulate. The only testimony that Sultan Halateke had two minarets before one of them oh, wow. fell That's in 1853, never to be restored again. A very romantic view, a pastiche of Larnaca in beautiful colors, but look at the, especially look at the uh, Greek costume, the Cypriot costume. Miniatures of a town, uh, of our towns, and here we have Nicosia with uh, Ermu Street, where we are. In every exhibition room, you will notice a small room in the corner. This room is, is uh, these rooms rather, because there are four of them, are our storerooms. But we keep our storerooms half open so that people can, can have a can see what you have inside. And yeah. See what else is coming out. We it's like as art, art by itself. Yes, we hope that uh, uh, every three years we will be able to change the, the interior of the museum and bring out other things because what we exhibit is one third of the collections. Wow. And for children, we have we take paintings like this one. And we reproduce them with authentic costumes and items so that children can understand it better. Sense, we yeah. allow them to touch, etc., so that they can feel it part of them. In the uh, exhibition halls, you will see a lot of display cabinets. Now, feel, please feel free to open the drawers because. Oh, I see. Yeah. Inside the drawers, we have items that relate to the period. Greek Cypriot embroidery. Ottoman flag finials from the siege of Nicosia in 1570. Um, be oops, sorry. Beautiful Cypriot costumes. This is the Karpas dress. And on this side, you will see uh, Turkish Cypriot embroidery. They love color. See? And Turkish Cypriot male dress. These sort of rich Turkish Cypriots would dress in bindale. Uh -huh. Bindale means a thousand uh, branches, and it's a t technique of uh, uh, gold thread embroidered on velvet. Whereas our Turkish Cypriot ladies, well off ladies who be dressed in beautiful colors. Yeah, they are. Look at this. Hmm? This is 18th beautiful century. Beautiful colors, yeah. yeah. They would all wear the gilet. Poor man's, rich man's, and the pouch. Mm. The more embroidery the pouch had, had on it, the more para it had in it. <laughs> the pasha. He would always carry with him his ink pot, and he would wear lavish shoes. Hmm? 
whereas the visitors would be dressed in beautiful coats. Hmm? And the Cypriots, the Greek Cypriots, would be dressed just like their archbishop to told them. Keep your heads down. Keep your clothes dark. Do not provoke the Ottomans. As for the women, you're talking about? No, I'm talking about the men and the women. Oh, the men. Oh, this is about the men and the women. Wow. Yes. And you see, we are dressed in with black vraga and black boots. Right. Dark colors. Huh? That's interesting, yeah. Yeah. The women wore scarves, different kinds, mm -hmm. different designs. And every Friday, both Greek and Turkish women would go to the hammam. They would wear the charikya, they would, wear, they would take their tas, uh, their bowls, 18th, 19th, 20th century, and then afterwards they would wear the kurugla, which was the white scarf so that the color wouldn't run with the steam and the water that was in the hammam. Hmm? Now let's walk up the ramp. What are the building hours for this building? Or the the opening days? hours? Yeah, for the uh, public yeah, to come and see you. 9.30 to 5 uh, o'clock during uh, winter, uh -huh. and 9.30, and sorry, 10 o'clock to 6 during summer. And you all, you close on Sundays and Mondays? No, we're open on Sundays, we close on Mondays. Oh, just on Mondays, okay. All museums. Okay, here we have engravings of the 19th century, middle of the 19th century about Cyprus, that were presented in Greek, English, sorry, in English, French, and German magazines. And here we have a special section of political cartoons. Uh -huh. When England took over Cyprus, France was really upset because they wanted the island. So they made a series of cartoons against England. You see here, England eating the pike or ship. England getting drunk on the wines of Cyprus. And this one, which is quite good, England pulling Cyprus from the heart of the Sultan. Whereas, we've got here, uh, from 1897, a beautiful engraving of, from the uh, Petit Journal, Greeks and Turks fighting, and the great powers playing the music. Like today. <laughs> and then there was a dispute between Disraeli and Gladstone, the head of the opposition in England. Uh, Disraeli wanted Cyprus by hook or by crook. Disraeli said the Anglo-Turkish Convention would never last, and Cyprus would become a burden, didn't it? Well, there you are, the Anglo-Turkish Convention, like a baby on a treetop. The Anglo-Turkish Convention, that Humpty Dumpty sitting on a wall. The Anglo-Turkish Convention, walking on a tight rope. And finally, and this is quite funny, this Lord Beaconsfield, Israeli Prime Minister, sleeping with Miss Cyprus and receiving dirty looks from Gladstone. <laughs> Let's move on. Yeah, I'm right behind you, following you. Wow. Now, 1878, England takes Cyprus. Here we have Sir Garland, who's just as he was wearing his uniform, and next to him, the uh, first police force he established, which was called the Cyprus Regiment. And here we have the Cypriots in the 19th century. As we said, Turkey, the only way to distinguish who were the Greeks and who were the Turks was by the colors they wore. Turkish Cypriots, lighter colors. Greek Cypriots, as we said, Dark. darker colors. And we have the Turkish Cypriot girl that is not covered. She doesn't cover her face. Mm -hmm. Our Turkish Cypriot girls, women, were far more liberal than their Muslim sisters in the area be it because they lived in a majority of Greeks, be it because they were nearer to Europeans, be it because they were far away from Istanbul, but most probably because they were Halevites. 
and the Halevites were not fanatically fanat religious fanatics, mm -hmm. and they didn't really like the Ottomans. So they were much happier in Cyprus, where they didn't have the Ottomans directly on their back, and they didn't have to go to the mosque five times a day. <laughs> and when the first British ladies came to Cyprus, and the Cypriot ladies saw the European costumes, the European dress, well, they were, um, uh, th they wanted to be in fashion as well. But they couldn't afford a European clothes. So what happens? They make it locally, they copy. And because Cyprus had a lot of silk and cotton, the Cypriot women weave cotton and silk on the loom and make dresses uh, copying the European clothing. And where they don't have money to buy lace, they do crochet work. But they're not daring enough to wear the big hats. They will keep their scars. So we have a development of the Cypriot costume whereby the bottom is European and the top remains Oriental. Right. Um, various views of Cyprus um, from mountains, from our villages. This is an amazing collection. And here we have beautiful uh, christening robes. Now the Cypriots followed the European European mode, and our children wore long gowns, both boys and girls. Hmm? This one has the stain of the pp on it. I haven't washed it. All right. <laughs> wow. Original. And a collection of our wedding gowns. Now, the Turkish Cypriot wedding gowns were the famous Fingerlet, which I explained, a thousand branches on the, uh, embroidered on, on velvet, 18th century. 19th century Greek Cypriot wedding dress made on the loom by uh, silk, from silk. The first Cypriot, the first European dresses imported in Cyprus and one of the first that was locally made when we had our own tailors uh, to do so. As we had our christening, uh, the Turkish Cypriot had their circumcision ceremony for boys between four and seven years old. And here we have their dress. They used to dress their children like sultans. Hmm? And here we have women's underwear, silk underwear that the women used to wear. Um, we have the village uh, uh, dresses. Hmm? Aha, the night dress and the wedding sheet. With, oh, this, wow, still, with the blood stains on it to stays, prove yeah. that the bride was a virgin. Wow. This is from 1860. And here we go. Shoes galore. <laughs> Very nice. A wonderful view of from Augusta Gate. Look at the moat. Look at the camel caravan leaving the town the Carinia mountain range at the back and the English supervising works in the moat. The first dinner service at Government House when Garnet Woosley came, he wanted to give dinner parties. But there was no dinner for service in Cyprus. We were poor, we were eating out of tin plates and clay plates. So he ordered one and he asked that it be decorated with the flamingos of Larnaca. So here we go, the Cyprus dinner service. Wow. Right? Yeah, very nice plates. Let's move on.
The next two rumps are full of paintings of Cyprus from various periods, starting with the Legislative Council of 1928, where nobody agreed with anybody and on nothing. Just like <laughs> so, <a day. laughs> so Ronald Storz, Storz dissolved it. And here we have the one and only photograph of the deputation that went to England in 1919 to ask, for goodness sake, Union of Cyprus with uh, Greece from the British. They spent their money staying there for a whole year, achieved nothing, and came back empty handed. <laughs> Lambusa, Armenian Quarter, yeah. Lambusa Monastery, Karinia, Nesauria, Kantara, Karma Village, the Cypriot Portraits, various portraits. Right. Here we have. I want the small watercolour of Carinia Gate before the British cut the walls. Mm -hmm. Did the openings. And we move to the next floor. There is a special room dedicated to the last tragic queen of Cyprus, Caterina Cornaro, during the end of the 19th century. There was a revival of the historical portrait. And when it came to Cyprus, the artists were inspired by a Venetian period. So we did uh, the room of Caterina Cornaro. Here she is. Wow. <laughs> Our last queen. Setting up from Venice, to come to Cyprus. Arriving in Cyprus, the crown is waiting for her to become queen, huh? to be crowned queen. A year later, her husband dies and her child die under mysterious circumstances. And the Dodge calls her to tell her, and here she is dressed in black, mourning her family, calls her to tell her that either she abdicates or she will make the same death as her family did. So, in a beautiful pre-Raphaelite painting by Jacques Vagres, Caterina Cornaro is handing over the crown of Cyprus to the Dodge of Venice. And here are two beautiful portraits of Caterina. There's our queen. And there's Caterina after she left uh, Cyprus. And if one notices the dress, she's dressed Different, yeah. in something which looks very much like the Cypriot costume, the alaja and the and the um, uh, sarya, sarya. Mm -hmm. And a beautiful Raphaelite painting of Caterina Cornaro. Uh, personifying Cyprus at a moment where Venice is turning her back to her and the Ottoman is receiving her. It's 1571 when Ottoman we move from the Venetian Venetia period Korea. to the Ottoman. Okay. I'm sorry about this. No, no. We have a lot of watercolors of the flower, the flora, of, of flora the, uh, the flora of Cyprus, and here are some. I'm going to stand only at this one, which is nothing much as a watercolor, but it's a mandrake, and it has sick historical significance because. Uh, during the 19th century, Cyprus was known as Le Mandragor, La Mandragore du Levant, the Mandrake of the Levant, 
Why? Because they believed that it was so difficult to uproot the people from this island as it is to uproot the mandrake from the earth. And here we have uh, various views of Karine, which the British loved, huh? the castle, the harbor, but also L'Orientalism. The British loved the exotic and the oriental. And that they found in our bazaars and in our hands. So, here we have Hermos Street Bazaar, as it was on the 20th of December. We will be uh, um, doing Hermos 1900. We will uh, uh, dress Hermos like this, as it used to be in the 1900s, and have the old bazaar they instituted, uh, reinstated. Uh, we, this is uh, the bazaar in the north, and of course, our hands. Simeon Han at the end of the road. Gladys Peter was the only artist that came to Cyprus and um, uh, painted Cyprus in the rhythms of the Art Deco. She was a colonialist. She does the Brits in their club. She does the Cypriots with the animals in the streets. And when a Cypriot lady dares tell her how beautiful she is and pats her on the cheek, Gladys says this is a curious habit of patting you upon the cheek, which is rather disconcerting. She doesn't like it. I'm going to stop here for a moment to talk about Keith Henderson, who, one of the first pontillists of England, a beautiful view from Augusta. Hmm? The camel driver. This one? Yeah. Nicosia taken from afar with the minarets and the palm trees and the cypress trees protruding from the walls. The, the Mufti of Arab Ahmed. And finally, my favorite painting, Peristerona, the village going to Trudos with the 11th century five dome church. The village here is totally dead. Nothing is moving. It's as if it's lost in time or time has stopped at it. There are no animals, no people, no birds, no smoke, nothing as the Venetian bridge over a dry river. And out of the river, walking towards the viewer, come children, Greek and Turkish Cypriot, with no faces, like ghosts, as if they have no future. And it's so prophetic, because the children never had a future. A few years later, Peristenona was divided, the Turkish Cypriots left, and these children never got together again. And on a happier note. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's getting really sad. Narnaca. Yeah. Yeah, on Sundays, the people, along with the consuls, here uh -huh. he is with his wife, used to walk uh, by the beach. They used to take their Sunday from an hour. When Donald Woosley arrived and saw the commotion on the beach, he asked what was happening. And he was told, this is the uh, Sunday promenade. So he said, I'm going to go down to the beach and walk with this, my new people. So he went and started walking. And suddenly he stopped and he asked his ADC, tell me, do these people have special customs? The ADC said, not that I'm aware of, sir. Why? Because, he said, wherever I turn, I see, I, I have the impression that the men make love to the women all on the same month because all the women I'm ready to deliver. Pregnant, yeah. <laughs> so the ADC looked around and said, No, sir, I'm afraid. There is a much simpler answer. The Cypriot women are fat. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Now we're getting towards the 20th century. Uh -huh. Views of Cyprus from that era, churches, 
a fellow pastor, Archangel Michael, the Church of Karenia, Kiko Monastery, Omodos Monastery, Trovidisa, and of course a monk. From this point onwards, we have a, uh, a series from our old posters of Cyprus, starting with the Cyprus government, uh, government railway timetable, huh? moving on to a beautiful map of Nicosia before division. Oh, yeah. Hmm? The first ever poster of poor old Cyprus Airways done in 1949 by Roy Knuckles with the Dakota flying over the Carinia Castle. You know that Cyprus Airways was shut down this year. Yeah, I'm aware of it, yes. And Fortunately. one of the first posters that the British ever made about Cyprus in 1938. And of course, it had to be Carinia because they, they loved, loved Carinia. Carinia. Yeah. And then there's a series of other posters of all sorts of towns, places, ideas. The British, during the 30s, 40s, and 50s, tried to promote the island as a tourist destination so as to bring uh, people in to live money and entrepreneurs to invest. So, buy Cyprus cigarettes. <laughs> Look at our uh, um, sites, Ayos Lazarus, etc., Halasuta. <coughs> And we move to the last floor. We're in the 20th century, in the 30s. Government house, as it used to be, with a big desk at the entrance with, a, with an ink pot with red ink so that the Archbishop could sign whenever he visited the governor in October 1931. The Greeks demonstrated against new taxation, heavy taxation, and march to government house, and be it by accident, or be it on purpose, they threw fire and burned it to the ground. And of course, they had to pay for a new government house. <laughs> this is the theodolite belonging to Lord Kitchener, who did the first cartography of Cyprus, on which our land registry is based even today. And here we have the Apostle really says, oh, well, uh, uh, close when he appeared to court to defend Evagoras Pandigaridis. This was donated by Kate Clerides. And there we have the military uniforms. The Cypriots took part in World War II, including our ex-president, uh, Vlachos Clerides. So we have his memorabilia his mother, here. Yeah. We have the letter he wrote to his family telling him, telling them that he's alive and just been freed by the Americans because they thought he was dead and they were giving, they were making memorial services in, for him. And here we have the cap he used while he was a prisoner in Germany. Hmm? There you go. But during World War II, 52,000 Jews came through Cyprus on their way to the Promised Land. And some of them made some views of, of their lives behind barbed wire in German, in German expression style. And here we have uh, memorabilia from uh, the Jewish camps at Karaolos in Famagusta, the children made dolls to play with. They printed their own new newspapers, etc. Memorabilia from the British period. Hmm? Including a hot water bottle, baby bottle, salt from Larnaca, the uh, uh, cigarettes we produced, Matches, yeah. Yeah, everything. Wow. And in 1924, Kemal Atatürk throws out the dervishes from Turkey, who find refuge in Cyprus and in Syria. In Cyprus, the whirling dervishes 
work at Mevlevi Peke in North Nicosia. Here it is. Uh -huh. Very near Karinia Gate, when they wear their dressed in white in purity, they have one palm looking up to the sky, receiving the blessing of Allah, and the other one looking down on earth, giving it to the people on earth. Even today, twice a year, the real dervishes from Konya come and whirl at Mevleviteke in honor of the 29 dead leaders who are buried there. 16th August 1960, midnight, the last governor of Cyprus, Sir Hugh Foote, pulls down the last British flag and raises the Cyprus flag in the presence of Archbishop Makarios and Dr. Faisal Kuchuk. That last flag that came down from Government House is the one you see here. Is this one? Wow. Yes. And Independence, 1960. Here we go. The album of all the pictures from those days that belonged to Glavkos Klyvidis and Katie was kind enough to donate. That's very nice of them. Yeah. Cypriot artists that uh, first appear in Cyprus at the early 20th century. These are a few that were influenced from the British School of Art. Yamandis, Kissonergis, Lugia Nikolaidou, Chaldash, Turkish Cypriot, Mehmet Nechati, one of the oldest first Turkish Cypriots with the camel hand just next to Hagia Sophia, it doesn't exist anymore. And Ismet Gune. Ismet Gune was the artist that designed the Cyprus flag we use today. Oh yeah, the teacher, our the teacher. teacher. Yes, yes, exactly. And now on this wall, we have paintings from artists that come, came to the island and keep on coming after the 1960s. Uh, lured by the light, by the landscape, and by the colors of the island. And we finish our tour by presenting a piece of art by a Turkish Cypriot artist called Emin Cizenel, who did this in 2003 in view of the Anand plan, the solution of the Cyprus problem, and with the hope that this island would be reunited. So what does he do? He takes one of the cypress trees from Pelapais, he covers it with a huge nylon, you can see here, mm -hmm. and he puts under it a red light. And he calls it the chosen tree, a candle for peace, which we're still waiting for. All right, we'd like to thank you for this amazing tour. Let me just take you no next more? Okay. door. Okay. Where we I thought you were know, so the last part. That's what no. I thought. We have the glass. Oh, yeah, tree. yeah. It is library. Right, right. It's a whole, the top floor library with all his books and memorabilia. The one that was donated by his daughter, correct? Yes, donated by oh, his wow. daughter. Wow. His nice. medals. Let me just take a picture of it. Some of his medals, I should say. But some of his medals, wow. <laughs> plenty, plenty more. That's a lot of medals. Some of the commemorative gifts he was given. Look. His pipes. I know he smoked the pipe a lot, yeah. Yes. Um, as I said, 5,000 photographs, albums galore wow. of photographs. But this is his library, 3,000 books. That's amazing. Yeah. We use this room and we rent it out because we want it to be alive. We want people to come in and feel this room and we want this room to, to take the vibes. Hmm? Okay, Rita, thank you very much You're for this very uh, impressive tour. And uh, tell us again the name of the institute, of the foundation, and the uh, foundation and is tell us a little Costa bit more. Costa and Rita Severis Foundation, whose home is the Center of Visual Arts and Research in in Ermu Street.
285 Ermo Street in the walled city of Nicosia. We are open from 9.30 to 5 uh, in summer and from uh, 9.30 to, uh, sorry, from 10 o'clock to 6 in uh, summer. Did I say it wrong? I think I did. No, no that's why. Uh, it's 9.30 to 5 in winter uh -huh. and 9.30 to 6 in summer. We have uh, the building contains the museum, we have a wonderful roof terrace and we have a lovely restaurant that works lunchtime and dinner and a wonderful atrium. And as we are a private enterprise, we have absolutely no support from anybody. Oh, really? so Not even the European Union? Or nobody even? supports us. Uh, well, we are trying very, very hard to keep our, our heads above water. So we rent out space here mm -hmm. for corporate events, for any kind of event and uh, anything that can take place here uh, in line with what we do. We also receive a lot of schools, all ages, and we give them educational programs which are uh, approved by the Ministry of Education free of charge. Every Saturday afternoon we have games for children organized within the museum so they learn and play. And uh, soon we will start again the programs of Paramithias. Last year the two girls, Paramithias, uh, received children once a month and told them the story of Caterina Gornaro. This year we have another story of another queen. Last year we heard about the last queen. This year we're going to hear about the first queen of Cyprus, Melusine. Okay, Rita, thank you very much. Thank you for coming. And I really, really appreciate it. We're going to post this video on YouTube and also uh, in various Cyprus uh, group Facebook books. And my group in particular is the Cyprus Culture Group, where we have at the moment over 5,000 members from all over Cyprus and from all over the world. Well, so I people, hope they visit us. <laughs> yeah, they definitely will. Now they'll see the, the video and uh, write down the address and everything and we'll come and say hello and visit the museum. Thank you very much. Thank you.